Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Stephen King Podcast. This is episode 101, and I have with me a returning guest uh, who's always a pleasure to have him aboard again, and that is Bryant Burnett. Hey, Lou. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Very generous of you to say it's a pleasure to have me. <laughs> well, especially when it's true. It's so easy to say. Bryant, of course, runs an excellent blog, The Truth Inside the Lie. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he writes uh, pretty detailed uh, analysis of all things King and other things as well. But uh, ostensibly, it's mostly Stephen King related. And today we're going to talk uh, a little bit of King, but mostly about Joe Hill, who is also running with a pretty good track of his own. And while it's he's not maybe quite at the level of recognition of his father, I think that's a lot to do with us, that his father's got a 40 year head start on him. But uh, the way he's going in this explosion of media outlets. Joe Hill will probably do fine as time passes by. Uh, he seems like he's trying to make up some ground for sure. Absolutely. First, we're going to talk about Pet Cemetery, the 2019 version of the film. And uh, it's out in theaters now. It's doing relatively well at the box office, but uh, it's behaving more in the manner of a traditional horror movie, not nearly doing the same numbers as It Chapter One did. But I don't think that's really a surprise on a couple of fronts. I mean, it's it's not as well known. It doesn't have the Pennywise cachet, I guess you could say. Plus, it's a much darker tale and a much more intense story than Pennywise and It has a much like that Stand By Me club vibe. So uh, I'm not really surprised with the box office numbers for it. How about you? I'm not surprised in the one sense because, you know, everything you just said is accurate. But one thing that's worth noting is that if it follows the same trend that it's following now, it's not even going to make quite as much money as the original Pet Cemetery made which is pretty big step down considering that was 30 years ago. Yes, I, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, the original made $57 million in 1989 money. I don't know what that translates to in 2019 money, but it was a pretty big hit for the time. This one is not, which is interesting. What it basically means is just that they weren't able to sell people on the idea that it was a movie they should see. Yes, and it's... It's so interesting. I, like, I don't really know how to attack this, but I think what I, I definitely have my thoughts about it, and I've, I've already made them known through Twitter and whatnot. I'm, and I don't know if you've written any posts about this yet, uh, Brian, but what the, what's your I, take no, on this I latest version? But I would like to. Mm -hmm. So what's your take? I liked it, but I had a strange reaction to it. Or, or I don't know if it was a strange reaction. I don't know what you'd say, but I, I watched it and I enjoyed everything in it the whole way through and then when the movie ended i just sort of walked out saying to myself well all right that was a movie <laughs> I, I and I, I don't really know why i had that reaction because i didn't i didn't hate the way it ended and i don't know if we want to get into spoilers or not but I didn't hate the way. Oh, it yeah. So I should have mentioned that off the top. Sorry, uh, listeners. This will definitely be a spoiler filled version review of this movie. And I have the same feeling walking out the theater as you. Like I me, you know, I went with my son and I just went after it was over. Says that was OK, but I don't think I ever have to watch it again. <laughs> and I really think it's just uh, it. I just didn't connect emotionally to the story which is weird because on any level or uh, really i think across the board this movie is a superior production to the yeah original version like the the acting is better i think probably for me the only thing that doesn't quite measure up is i still think the cat from the original movie is way creepier than the one that they used in this mo uh, movie and i think the she uh, mary lambert shot that cat better you, she got like the eye reflections a couple times this never really happened with that cat and it just it just kind of looked like it was dirty. It didn't look like it was dead. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. It's so it's it's interesting, but uh, you know, 
if I had to recast one part, I mean, this might upset some people out there that who are fans of him, but Jason Clark has never really been what I call, um, like he's a competent actor, He's, but he's never one that I engage emotionally with. I, he always leaves me cold. And in this movie, he has the, the most important part and he just didn't sell it to me emotionally and i think part of that was too is that the the filmmakers really rushed through the events after the accident and i think that hurt the the final act quite a bit Uh, they rushed through everything quite frankly i i liked jason clark more than you did to some extent lewis as a character is a little on the cold and distant side he's kind of a cipher that's not a hundred percent true of the novel but but it kind of is and he's got that quality so it works in a way but that's more of like an intellectual thing than a than an emotional thing and for movies you want emotion so it it, he worked for me okay but i've you're not the only person that i've heard say that and i totally get why it's a thing that people are latching on to is one of the reasons the movie doesn't work. One of the problems that I had is that it just doesn't show you anything about the creeds before they move to Ludlow. And it's the same way in the 1989 version, but it's not a problem there for some reason. I don't know. This, this is just a strange case for me. It's, yep. it's one where I'm kind of more interested in my reactions than I am in the movie itself. <laughs> um, because they don't yeah. really add up. Yeah. Uh, and I've struggled to think of another case where I had these reactions to a movie. Yeah. It's, it's weird because I, I don't know if it's it, because your reaction to this type of stuff is so subjective and, oh it, yeah, and maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just getting old, but I just wasn't scared no. really at any point in the story. And I had the same thing with us. Uh, that was a movie that I thought was really well done, but then in that case, it wasn't the acting, but it was the reveal of the the underlying story that it just like I said that that just doesn't make any sense, and then that just totally killed killed the movie for me. But while I was watching the movie, I thought it was really well shot, and all those scenes were really working for me. But then all the air went out of the movie when they revealed like this story that was uh, supporting the central conceit of that movie. So, but the difference with that movie is, and this one is, I. I just don't, the director's eye for the way they set up their shots just didn't really work for me as a horror movie. It, it felt really flat. I don't know how, uh, what other word to use for it. Like the, none of the shots had tension for me. Uh, I didn't like some of the transition shots where he would open the door and he'd be into the to the woods. I thought that was cheesy. They ignored the deadfall. They didn't make much of a big point of it in the first movie too, but it, it's when King writes it, that whole that clump of wood has like a, almost has a personality. Like there's a malevolence to it in the, but in the movies, they just totally ignore that. And it just like, I, you know, if I compare like the way uh, Flanagan shot Gerald's game and haunting of Hill house, there's a, a style there that just pulls you into the story. And it's like a quiet place, even though that has that other well, mechanism of you have to be quiet. It's just the way the movie was shot that it pulls you in. And this movie I just felt like I was being pushed back or, or watching through a window. I, I, and that's a, a subjective thing that's very hard to put a, any sort of qualitative, quantitative uh, measures yeah. against. Yeah, that's true. And there are so many elements that go into a movie that I, I come back to the idea that any time a movie is good, much less great, it's magic. Like, it's almost a miracle when it happens to me. Yep. But something you just said, I'd been thinking about this as I've been trying to puzzle out how I really felt about this movie. I don't think it's any grand revelation to say that a huge part of the reason why Stephen King is Stephen King is the voice that he writes with. That's why, I think at least, that's why most people that are return customers for Stephen King's writing, that's why they come back to him. because. Um, absolutely absolutely they appreciate and are drawn to his voice for me if you're ad- adapting his work to the screen it's more important to capture voice and i don't necessarily even mean stephen king's voice you can you can do it that way which is what frank darabont does but i feel like you can also replace it with just an 
individual filmmaking voice of your own. That's why I'm a huge fan of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Not everyone is, but to me, he just he he plucked Stephen King's voice out, replaced it with Stanley Kubrick's voice. You still have a great experience. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's the issue with this movie is that there's just no real voice of anyone because I'm not sure Stephen King's voice is really present in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just don't know that these filmmakers have their own. Although I will say I loved their first movie, Starry Eyes. Yeah, I haven't seen that movie, so I need to watch that. To Maybe it'll help me look at this version of uh, Pet Cemetery in a, a different way because I just felt, I don't know, it just felt very mechanical. And I, I think they, I, f- I just feel like they concentrated on the wrong parts of the story. Um, like, because the, the third act, it, it, you know, that's, it's pretty deep into the movie, but by the time we get there, I didn't really feel like they had made the best use of the story in, in terms of getting across what they were trying to set up. There wasn't really any bonding scenes between Lewis and Judd. You know, I, th- I thought the little girl was fantastic, though. I thought mm-hmm. she did a pretty yeah. good job. But yeah, it's weird. And and the switch, I don't know if it was a good idea to show it in the trailer or not. Maybe that would have made the movie more impactful. Oh, I but in the end, it really this. OK, we'll talk about that. <laughs> But in the end, I don't I don't feel like it changed the story, really. And really, the ending of this movie is pretty well the same the, uh, as the other movie. But I guess the difference there is that Lewis actively decided to revive his wife, even though what happened to his daughter or, or to Gage was obviously a disaster. But in this movie, it's just sort of another, uh, I don't know, zombie origin story. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, I, I was OK with the change from Gage to Ellie. When, when that trailer came out, I was fine with it because I felt like I understood why they made it. Frankly, the odds of them having gotten a kid that could do what Miko Hughes did playing Gage in the 1989 version, the odds of replicating that can't be good. They weren't good for the 89 version. Talk about a miracle. Finding a kid that could do that role that well at that age, I, that's impossible. They just somehow pulled it off. So I, I totally get not wanting to try that again. But I and I didn't come to this conclusion until I actually saw the movie. I think it was a monumental mistake to reveal that in the marketing. Because imagine if you're sitting, and I'm not the first person to say this by any means, imagine if you're sitting there watching that movie with the understanding you think that you're basically just watching a remake of Pet Cemetery. Well, it's filmed to push you along that path. Gage runs out in the road, sort of chasing Ellie. And yeah, it's played to where you think that he's about to get greased. But then something else happens. It's clear as day that the filmmakers intended that to be a huge surprise. And I think that if it had actually had that surprise impact on audiences that people might have walked out of the theater buzzing rather than deflated. So Hmm. if, if only on the box office, I think this probably had a pretty significant negative impact. I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, but I think it's a shock that has very short shelf life because once you get over that and say, okay, they changed that up, but then you watch the rest of the movie and it doesn't really impact the story to that great of a degree. I mean, yes, but, she gets a couple of more lines lines and stuff like that in there, but she doesn't, like, the story still carries the same arc pretty well, so. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I would, and this is just pure speculation, but I think that if you have a big surprise like that, it, it impacts and reframes the way you watch the entire rest of the movie. You then watch that last half with a different mindset, so it plays differently. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's one of the things that really frustrates me about this is that I will never be able to have that experience watching <laughs> it. So I, I'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other thing was uh, Ellie's, Ellie's injuries were like, she looked very un, untarnished for the most part. Like if you get smacked like that, she should have been in much yeah. worse shape. And they just really, I don't know they they really dialed that back. And I, if you're going to go there, well, they didn't, go there. they didn't go there with Gage in the first movie either, to be honest. I, the theory there is probably it would just be too gruesome. But I kind of agree with yeah. you, actually. That, that's 
<laughs> Although um, I did one of the scenes in the movie that I genuinely thought was terrific was the one where Lewis was brushing her hair and sort of fine staples. Yes. I mean, that's 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 yeah. horror. You know, you you're not going to be able to do much yeah. better than that. That's kind of what I wanted from the whole movie. Yeah, 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 exactly. And on a positive notes, again, I, I thought the acting was strong. And I thought that it's no surprise that, oh, now his name's uh, escaping me. Who, who played Judd Crandall? Uh, Why am I blanking on his name? John Lithgow. <laughs> John Lithgow, jeez, I thought he was fantastic. Sans, uh, you know, any mm-hmm. sort of uh, attempt at a main accent, I thought he was great. And but th- they also had that show and show versus tell element w- with his dog. They should have shown that in a flashback. I think it would have been more impactful instead of to him just telling Lewis about it. But and it was weird that the parents, Amy's parents, or Amy Rachel's parents, never talked or had any speaking lines. Like that whole tension was lost as well so yeah some weird choices i don't know well a couple things number one skype is super glitchy for me today so i didn't hear any of what you just said but i assume it was brilliant and correct <laughs> you assumed correctly sir <laughs> um no i i did i did uh, i was just gonna say regarding the parents that was kind of a strange decision but two things about that number mm-hmm. it, it feels to me like there's probably about 45 minutes that got cut out of the movie. Like this seems like one where they whittled it down to the bone. Maybe. So maybe they filmed something, but at the same time, they may not have because I was kind of surprised by how little impact that had on the plot to pluck all that out. So somebody may have just looked at that and said, you know what? Yeah. We don't really need this. And they were kind of right. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is a strange movie. I really want to see a second time to see how it plays for me because I kind of have a feeling mm-hmm. that over time, the things about it that I like, which is a pretty good chunk of it, will take on more weight, mm-hmm. but it could go the complete opposite direction. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I definitely want to, s- I definitely need to watch it again. I don't really feel like wanting to watch it again, but I, I think to give it its proper placement, I need to, to watch it more than once. It's just, uh, uh, what what did you think of the framing device with showing like the, the end of the movie at the beginning? I, I liked it once it was pointed out to me that the bloody handprint on the door gave you a hint as to what happened after the credits began to roll. I thought that was pretty cool, but somebody had to point it out to me. Granted, you know, I'm not the most observant person in the world. So, but that <laughs> that's one of those things that makes me think that when I watch it a second time, I'll watch it with that understanding of what that means. Maybe it'll make it a little cooler. I still don't understand why Judd's house was burning. Yeah. I guess they just wanted to hide the body or have the body in a in a shape that that they, they couldn't determine what was the, the true cause of death was. I don't Maybe. know, but they could still see that his 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 you know that he had been had his Achilles tendon severed. I assume that, but maybe not. I don't know. It depends on how badly he gets burnt. But I think they were just trying to hide his death. I'm surprised that they didn't actually try to resurrect him too. But I think they had just seen the Mary Lambert movie and knew a house was supposed to be on fire. That's that's my theory. <laughs> uh, beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> Quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. This movie is very strange. And I, I think part I'm partly disappointed because I heard so much yeah, positive buzz yeah. about it coming out of South by Southwest. You know, the same same with us. I was both those movies got really praised and to a level where I was expecting something, you know, where my expectations were improperly calibrated. And both movies to me are just OK. And I was expecting really good to excellent. And, yeah, that's kind of hard to take. I I just. I didn't I didn't get a chance to give you my opinion on us. I loved us. I absolutely loved it. Okay. The stuff that you mentioned as far as the reveal of what was behind all of the, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Tot- that's totally true. Yep. It it makes no sense whatsoever, but in that particular case, I was so invested in the characters and the performances and the filmmaking that once it got to that point, I was like, "Hey, sure. Whatever. Let's let's go." It's fine by me. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of people that are in that boat. But uh, for me, it just it just doesn't it just doesn't hold up. And if that doesn't hold up, then everything else that's built on top of that doesn't have this. I have to knock it down a bit because it's built built on a yeah. false premise. So whereas like a get out works, us could have worked if the scale 
wasn't so big if they had just maybe restricted it to this particular town or maybe to the family but this conceit that that you know that this is happening for a whole country and maybe for the whole world i don't know that's not really addressed in the movie it just doesn't just doesn't work for me so then it yeah it just kind yeah. of falls apart right yeah that was a bit much so but 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 it is a really well executed movie and again like you know like pet cemetery no complaints about the and i but i do think us was a better directed movie than pet oh, cemetery by far. but i thought the acting yeah the acting was top notch and i thought it was really well done Alrighty, so that's our thoughts on a uh, our confused thoughts, uh, not just because we're having Skype problems, but it's truly our reaction to the movie as well. So <laughs> we'll have to leave that as that. So now we're going to move over to talk about Joe Hill, who is his rise meteoric, maybe, maybe not, because he, he was at it for a while before he really started to gain traction. But once he did, boy, oh boy, he, he's really uh, an up and comer. And his story in the uh, flight or fright uh, anthology was like clear clearly the number one story oh, to yeah. me in that collection better maybe than all the others put together and i liked most of the other stories so yeah that's, like that's a heck of a thing to say but i think it might be true I, I agree with you and it's just his a mastery of switching povs in a short story and yet making each character unique was just unbelievable i mean i mean and the conceit of the story is not it's been done before in various forms so i but i just thought he really he just really nailed the the characters in that story. I was just blown away. And that seems to be his strength in his storytelling as well. I, I've been pretty impressed with most of his stuff. I was a little let down with his last book, The Fireman. Uh, I don't know how you felt about that one. but For the most part, I thought it was really, really good. But there was also something vaguely unsatisfying about it. Yeah, mostly the ending. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> but that's it, just me. And Nosferatu sort of fell into this same category for me to jump ahead just a little bit. I, I would still give it if I if I were sending its report card at home with it, I'd probably still give it a B plus. Yep. Which is a disappointment compared to most Joe Hill stuff. But, you know, B plus is still pretty good. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, uh, that, that's yep. where I stood on that. All right. All right. So since you mentioned it, why don't we dive into Nosferatu? That's coming to AMC, starring a surprising pick in, in a way is mm -hmm. Quinto from Star Trek. But uh, he looks yeah. pretty good from what I've seen. Uh, what do you think about Nosferatu going to AMC? Well, I, I really like the book, so I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see if maybe it can be a huge hit and push Joe Hill into that next level as far as public recognition to go, mm -hmm. goes. But I got to be honest, it doesn't look great to me. And mm. in no way does that mean that I'm not going to watch it. It doesn't even mean that I don't think it looks good. I'm just not sure they're selling the concept in the marketing. I, I know it because I know the book. You know it because you know the book. Right. I don't know if I didn't know the book, if I would have the faintest notion what this series was about. So that kind of right. worries me a little bit. But the footage itself looks good. Yeah. Quinto is Charlie Manx. Looks uh, Yeah. You know, I, I never would have put his name on a list of people that I was going to look at for that role. But as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, that's that's a good that's a good choice. He, he's going to be good in that role. Mm hmm. Yeah, I guess they're they picked they're looking at what he did with the yeah. heroes. So, oh yeah, he was great. Uh, well, when he got cast as Spock, I thought, oh, the bad guy from Heroes, he's he's too mean to be Spock. But <laughs> the guy's pretty versatile, so yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him in yeah. this. Yeah, I don't know when this is set to premiere this year. June the second. June the second. Yeah, so coming up soon. That's good. Not very far away, and I wonder how many of the King references that were in the book are going to make it into the series. That would be interesting if to see If I'm not as mistaken, well. they showed the pilot episode, I believe, at South by Southwest uh, the same weekend that they had the first screening of Pet Cemetery, And apparently, in the opening credits, there's a, there's a mention of Derry. So, oh, okay. So it seems like they are going to include that aspect of the book, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. So really, but it's weird because all these adaptations are happening on different networks. So it's it's kind of like, how are you going to build a cinematic universe through that kind of a mechanism? I don't know. But uh, I don't know. These are uncharted waters. 
Yes, it's these are strange days, um, strange weather. Uh, we're coming into strange weather. From what I've seen of it, it, it looks good. We'll have to keep our fingers crossed. I, I would have to say that I'm more excited for Lock and Key because I just think that's a fantastic series. Have, are you familiar with the story for that one? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, and I really, really like that one. I'm Back when they did that pilot a couple of years ago and then they didn't get picked up, I thought was bummer. So I was bummed by that, too, although from, from what I remember reading, the pilot episode covered like about half of the first arc of comics, which is much too fast to go through that. It's just too good a story. It needs to be slowed down. So hopefully that's the approach they're taking with the comics uh, or with uh, the Netflix series, rather. Although there's no guarantee they'll actually follow the comics. Who knows? We'll see. But yeah, I'm I'm stoked for it. Yeah, for sure. Yes. And this is coming out on Netflix, as you mentioned. Uh, casting is Jason Robert Scott as Bode Locke, J- Connor Jessup as Tyler Locke, Emma- Amelia Jones as Kinsey Locke, Sherry Sham as Ellie Whedon, Griffin Gluck as Gabe, Darby Stanchfield as Nina Locke, uh, and there's um, some other characters listed as well. This is being developed by Carlton Cuse, who he's done some pretty great series, probably best known for Lost and most recently the um, Psycho series, Bates Motel. And he also did a series okay. that I really liked a long time ago was The Adventures of Briscoe County. Oh, I didn't know he worked on that. Yeah, with Bruce Campbell. That was a fun series as well. So I like the pedigree behind this one uh, quite a bit. And Netflix is, involvement is always a good thing. The pilot is going to be directed by Scott Derrickson, which is exciting because he's done some good stuff uh, as well. I think he's did the first Doctor Strange movie. So, so, and at one point, Annie Machete was uh, tagged to do some work on this, but I guess because of scheduling conflicts, oh, Derrickson had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. I thought it was Machete. So I'm not sure if Machete ended up... Machete, he directed, uh, there's actually a second pilot. Okay. That A second unused pilot, because this was going to be a Hulu series. Oh, okay. At one point. Wow. What, about a year, year and a half ago, something like that? Okay. Uh, yeah, basically right off, uh, right off the heels of it. Okay. Machete was hired for that. They filmed, they may have filmed two episodes. Don't hold me to that. They filmed at least one, and I think that the writer's room had written four or five scripts so i mean it it was it was going but then there was a regime change of some sort at hulu and the people that came in looked at it and said nope for whatever reason and so i I think one cast member survived the kid that played georgie and it okay survived the transition from the hulu version to the netflix version okay but otherwise it's I, i as far as i understand it's just completely a new thing right so to say this has been a, a troubled production road is uh is an understatement right. okay. but okay yeah I got... but it looks like it finally is happening for really for real right okay so i stand corrected then because uh i totally missed the fact that it was actually going to hulu and then finally transitioned over to netflix because uh as you mentioned it's had quite a change of players since then and carlton cuse's involvement is not as a showrunner anymore just Basically, I think they're using part of his uh, script or he's not totally. I don't think he's involved anymore at all. It's a totally different uh, crew. So uh, but it's still based on the work that he did for Hulu. So that's interesting. So (laughs) actually, I think and I I didn't do my research on this. uh, I apologize for that. Uh, But I think he is still on board because he if I'm not mistaken, he dropped off of being the showrunner for um, the Jack Ryan show that's on Amazon. He show ran that for the first season, but then I believe he dropped off of that to focus on lock and key. Okay. Hopefully I'm getting that right. If not, then, then it's all my fault. Yeah. But, uh, well, he's got a, but I think that's, he's got an executive producer credit on it and it's based on, it says the series is developed by him uh, amongst other people as well. So, yeah, it's and Andy Machete is an executive producer, so it's it's uh, it's all uh, very intertwined with people that are uh, previously connected to, to King's work in one form or another as well. So, we'll, so well, hopefully that has all sorted itself out, and we'll see what they're going to do with this. Don't know how many episodes are f- 
going to be in the first season. Oh, here, 10, 10 episodes, first season. So hopefully they're going to slow it down, like you were mentioning uh, earlier, and aren't going to rush through the, the, the storyline as per the comics. I, I hope so, too, because really Netflix is, seems to me at least, precisely the right place for this to be, especially if it's going to you know, run five or six seasons. I think it's just a natural fit for Netflix. Yeah, I totally agree. It will be interesting to see how the stand, uh, just to get back to King for Bix a bit, is going to, to mm. fare over at uh, CBS All Access, but we'll have to see. Okay, so that's an interesting production, and I I really like the Lock and Key comic series. I, I was pretty blown away by the story. The use of the keys is very imaginative. Uh, I specifically like the mind key that opens up somebody's head. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really cool. I don't know how you do that on film, no. but uh, if, they can crack, if they can crack that, so to speak, yeah. then that'll, that'll be something nobody forgets. That's for sure. And it has quite a few pretty amazing twists and turns to it as well so uh, it's a, it's a really uh, could be something really special i just hope that they can maintain these level of tension and suspense over a seasonal arc uh, that's going to be hard hard to do but we'll see the material is there so yeah. i if if they don't do it it's that's that's on them it's not on the source material that's for sure all right and speaking of netflix we have another project coming up with them and that is based on the 2012 novella from Stephen King and Joe Hill in The Tall Grass. And this, uh, cinematically, it's it's obvious, you know, it's a natural for being adapted. I have to say that I thought the first half of the story was far stronger than the second half. The second half got into some pretty weird elements that I don't think quite landed for me. I don't know how you felt about the story. I was, I actually remember when you and Hans reviewed that, I, I, I liked it uh, good bit more than both of y'all did okay i i saw your viewpoints but for me the second part just it landed like a ton of bricks on oh cool to me the first part set up the tension and then the second part totally paid it off granted i only read it the one time i might feel completely differently uh if i go through it again but lord knows if (laughs) If they if they adapt that faithfully, there's going to be some intense stuff in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the stuff that happens with uh, within the that one location works. It's just the other stuff that happens outside of it that I was just like, uh, I don't know even know why this is in the story. But like you, maybe I have to reread it again because it just sort of it really took me out of the story. The some of the elements, but yeah. Well, that could that could be the function of it having been written by two different authors. Yeah, maybe uh, yeah, because there's. There's there's no way to know who wrote what. I, if I remember it correctly, you and Hans felt like the first part was mostly King and the second part was mostly Hill. Yeah. And I could kind of see that. Mm. But I'd, I'd be curious to know if they wrote that the way that Sleeping Beauties was written, where they both sort of worked on everything by sort of passing it back and forth and then each rewriting the other. I don't know. I'm always fascinated by how collaborations like that work because it's so different than... You know, just one dude sitting down and writing a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have to see. So it's uh, it's in the can. It was filmed near in Toronto, Toronto, Canada area, and I believe it was done last September. So this this should be coming out soon. Uh, do you have an air date for this? I don't see anything. I looked it up before we started recording to see if I could find anything, and there isn't. My guess would be October. Probably. That just seems like a natural time for that to get rolled out but who knows we'll see yeah so patrick wilson's headlines along with lasia della oliveria sorry if i'm butchering that name but i, I don't recognize her I, I, i'm glad you took that <laughs> uh, she's uh she's playing dodge and lock and key by the oh, way is she oh okay interesting and harrison oh. gilbertson when i look at him he's an australian actor he looks familiar but i'm not sure what else he's been in let me just do a quick Upgrade. He's an upgrade. Need for Speed. He was in one of those movies. Fallen, Hounds of Love. Upgrade. I saw. He he must have had a small part in that because uh, I don't remember seeing him in that. But yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar with him at all. Actually, I I don't know anybody in this apart from Patrick Wilson. Okay, Rachel, Rachel Wilson. I, well, that's okay. Rachel Wilson. I know she's a Canadian actor. So 
that's an interesting choice. But uh, yeah, so I did a lot of filming around Toronto, and we're just really waiting now for Netflix to re- announce when this is going to be aired. But I think October would be a good bet. Hopefully, it. I'd, I'd be curious. I, I, I doubt if they would do a theatrical release for this, but probably not. I, I doubt it. I, I would say probably not. Yeah. So, have you seen any of the the director's other movies? Uh, uh, Vincenzo Natale. Let's see what else has he done here. The thing that he's most famous for is a movie called Cube, which I've never oh. seen, but I've always heard oh. interesting things. Yes, about. it's a low budget Canadian movie, but uh, because uh, it's yeah. all the sets are basically just this cube, but every. Every yeah. cube that you try to break out of, because if you don't, you're going to die, just leads to a, another puzzle or trap that you have to solve. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of some interesting parallels with that and, and in the tall grass. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I didn't realize he had directed that. And I've seen that. And there's another Stephen King connection because one of the stars of that movie is Nicole DeBoer, who of course was, um, part oh. of the uh, well, Dead Zone series. So interesting. <laughs> Six degrees of Stephen King separation go out working here. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, Kevin Bacon, uh, you might as well move over because <laughs> he's going to take over. He's uh, he's basically a, a, an industry. He used to be a cottage industry for Hollywood, but now I think he's more like a, a, a urban industry based on all the stuff that's being done for his uh adaptations right now it's pretty common for some project to have somebody that's been in a stephen king movie. yeah yeah that's uh yeah that's a pretty common thing and is only going to get more common yes yeah all right so those were the big adaptations um for joe hill uh i know he's got to have some involvements with creep show as well i believe oh that's right yeah he has a short story called and I may be slightly getting the title wrong, By the Silver Water of Lake Champlain, mm. which is a story that first appeared in a, a anthology called Shadow Show that was a, a tribute to Ray Bradbury. So it's kind of written in quasi-Ray Bradburyan mold. Okay. And it's I don't want to say too much about the story, apart from it being you know really good, but it's about two kids in a small town set on a lake where a sea monster... Uh, or a lake monster, I guess, either does or doesn't wash up on the shore of the lake. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see how that works on uh, Creep Show. Was that story in 20th Century Ghosts? Or I... No, but it is in, uh, he's got a collection coming out this October that it will be oh. in called uh, Full Throttle. Oh, okay, because I, d- uh, I don't think I've read that story then. In, yeah, it's it's only been in uh, the Ray Bradbury um, okay. tribute. Okay. But yeah, like like pretty much all of his stuff, it's it's well worth reading. Yes, uh, I look forward to that. Uh, look forward to reading his new collection as well. So, is there any other thing, anything else uh, that you can think of that we haven't mentioned about Joe Hill? Well, one of the other stories in Full Throttle, one that's never been released, uh, it's called Fawn, F A U N. Right. Netflix purchased the rights for this before it was even published it's i haven't read it obviously but it's got something to do with a somehow there's a portal that exists to a fantasy world like a narnia or something like that and the story evidently is about hunting expeditions that you can go on okay. to okay you know visit this magical world and go kill really rare creatures oh okay so wow Oh, that's kind of like a... Sounds kind of interesting. But a, yeah, it's like a riff on uh, Bradbury's uh, Days of Thunder. <laughs> yeah, and evidently Netflix was excited about it because I, I read about this when the news was announced and they, they won a bidding war for it. I don't know who all was involved. Hmm. There hasn't been any news about it since then, but apparently Netflix is uh, in the Joe Hill business. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a three studio bidding battle. It doesn't say who the other two were, but oh well. I'm still mystified that there's been no movie version of Heart Shaped Box. Yeah. I guess it's because it's not, it's not big enough, but it's one of the few books that had scary scenes during the daytime that actually creep me out that book is terrifying <laughs> yes that that restaurant sequence whoa oh yeah 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 i think if you got the right person in that role uh, that mm-hmm. movie could be a huge hit yeah for sure if you if you were to give me 50 million dollars right now mm-hmm. i would i would 
immediately call Robert Downey Jr. and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Let's <laughs> let's let's get this going." Yeah, he he would be a good pick. Uh, somebody that can play it broad like that for sure. In my mind, I can only think of older actors, so it's uh, like older. Like I'm thinking, like you know, actors that were 50 when I was growing up. But uh, nowadays, yeah. Daniel Day Lewis, of course, would be. <laughs> and if he lost some weight, the Gladiator guy. Uh, Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, yeah. It's too bad Ozzy Osbourne can't act. <laughs> wonder if wonder if Rob Zombie could act. I can, Ro- I can Rob Zombie, that real yeah, yeah, Pro- yeah. Th- probably. Yeah that that's uh, that book doesn't get nearly enough cred. I think I could definitely see a movie version of that for sure. Well, I I think if if one or more of these upcoming projects really pops, and mm-hmm. I've just there's something in my gut telling me that lock and key is going to be huge. Yes, um, I think so too. I think after that, everybody's going to be looking at Joe Hill's back catalog and that one's going to pop up pretty quick. Yeah, so for sure. I got for a sure. feeling within five or six years, that's a thing that we'll be seeing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, that book has some really creepy scenes. In it. <laughs> uh, I need to read it again, uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that would be a great one for an adaptation as well. Man, he's, uh, it's just, you know, he's, you know, King, uh, if you look at the careers of these two, King came around at the right time for the style of story that he was telling. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he rode the wave, you know, he's trying new stuff all the time, but his son has just like super embraced all these new methods of storytelling, uh, you know, like getting into comics with Lock and Key was big for him. And I, I think that has a large played a large part in his uh, success more than probably some of his books have but yeah. uh, well it it makes sense in a way uh mm-hmm. because one of the things that people have always said about Stephen King especially in his earlier years i think it's still true but certainly you know for the first couple of decades is that he was a guy that was just in tune with the country that he lives in in terms of its culture yes he was a product of that culture he was intimately familiar with it, and he was able to communicate it. Yeah. Well, it stands to reason that his son would, or sons would pick up some of those same qualities. So, in a sense, he's, you know, just that, but evolved. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I think it was when I had Steven Spignesi on. He said that somebody commented that King was a noticer, and uh, and I think mm, that yeah. uh, that's what uh, Joel Hill has as well. But he's got. He's a little more media savvy, but he, I mean, he grew up with the, you know, the internet yeah. and that as well. So, you, but you can really see that. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. And of course, Owen is a different writer. I think he, the, the character temperament wise, takes more after his mother, which I yeah. think his, his books are a bit different, but he's on the stand. Like he's part of the writer's room. So that's interesting as well. You know, so. yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. Yeah. As fans of King, I'm always excited when I hear about a new adaptation, but I'm now with what's happened with Pet Cemetery. It's kind of given me a little bit of a pause, and maybe his stories. I th- I like to think that they're timeless, but it's maybe some stories are just better left off. <laughs> I don't want to say dead, but uh, <laughs> untouched again. I don't know. It's it's all about the quality of the filmmaking. Yeah. So that's either going to be there or it isn't. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't think I don't think this was a bad movie. You could do a lot worse. Oh, yeah, uh, this sure. was no this was no this was no thinner. Or uh, what was that night shift uh, or something like graveyard that. shift? Yeah, the bang or the mangler. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You know what? I w- I wanted to. I almost forgot about this. I wanted to bring up one other thing in relation to Pet Cemetery. Uh, not the movie so much as the book. Okay. This this might be a decent button to go out on. You know, King's done several interviews around the release of the movie. And in those interviews, there was especially one with Entertainment Weekly where he talked again about the fact that he was kind of horrified by that novel when he wrote it and really didn't want to release it. He wrote it and then said, you know, no, I'm not showing this to anybody. Put it in the drawer. And uh, do you know this story? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yep. So after reading this, I started thinking about the idea that the only reason that the novel was published to begin with was because his relationship with Doubleday had gotten really sour and he owed them a book and said, fine, I got a book. Here's this lousy book. Take it and do what you will with it. 
What if that had not happened and Pet Cemetery was still sitting in a drawer somewhere and you know any books that he's got sitting around like that are going to come out someday after he's no longer with us. What if five years after he passes away, which hopefully won't be until the year 2050, but <laughs> what if a novel as good as Pet Cemetery came out after he was gone? Can you imagine how people would feel about that? Yeah. Oh, here's yeah. this. Here's this thing that had just been sitting in a drawer forever, and it's Pet Cemetery. Yeah. A masterpiece. Yeah. That just blows my mind to even think about that. <laughs> well, maybe there's... Because an... what if there are more? What if there exactly. are more? Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. Maybe there's one or two sitting in, the, <laughs> in a shelf right now that's not going to be published in, until uh, posthumous. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't think that King has too many things left in his drawer to pull out. I think he's past that stage, but... You Who knows? Know. Because he's so prolific, he might have written something else that he says, you know what, this is going to be a gift to my fans after I'm gone or something like that. I, I could see him doing something like that. Oh, yeah, totally. But it's crazy. Like, he's probably made more money in the last two years from all these adaptations than he did from the previous 40 um, on all his other books and um, adaptations. So, <laughs> you know, just with it alone, he probably had a nice cut of that profit as well. well so, Even if he didn't, just on the spike in sales from the book uh because yeah. it spent like half a year on bestseller charts again yeah so that's crazy I, i'm hoping that that's uh I'm, I'm hoping there's 40 more years in him personally yeah <laughs> it would be nice <laughs> but that's like what me and hans always used to talk we're, we're so spoiled and uh, so greedy we just you know here's a guy in his 70s put him pumping out uh two books a year when most writers are lucky to get one book out every five years. It's, it's crazy. Uh, and the quality doesn't really vary that much either. So that's the impressive no, it, thing. It, it really doesn't. I think about that sometimes, you know, I, when I became a huge Stephen King fan in high school, it was just a roll of the dice. It was just pure mm -hmm. happenstance. What are the odds that the guy that was going to become my favorite author would then go on to have the career over the next 30 years that he's had? Yeah, a lot of guys can't can't do things like that. Yep. If it were, I don't have any names to spring to mind, but if it had been somebody else instead of him, may have lost interest because yep. the writing got uh, worse. But with King, it's just been nonstop excellence, and it's mm -hmm. I feel like I got really lucky in terms of who I gravitated toward because that could well not been the case. Yeah, same here. I mean, it's uh, I, I feel for audiences today who uh, like are waiting for George R. R. Martin to finish the next uh, Game of Thrones book, but because <laughs> yeah. because I honestly don't think that he's ever going to finish that series. No, I I I don't either. I I'm not sure he wants to because he's lost he's lost the drive now. Yeah, because now the the series has eclipsed him. So it's kind of like well, I'm telling a story, but everybody knows. 90% of what's going to happen. So it takes a lot of the uh, the fun out of writing if your audience is ahead of you. So I, I think at this point, he'd be better off just to adapt the TV episodes and call it a day. <laughs> yeah. but, That's kind uh, of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, you know, we've, uh, we've wandered all over the place, but it's kind of fun to have these water cooler chats every once in a while, too. I've, uh, I've quite enjoyed it. And it's I keep saying it every podcast that the, it's great times to be a Stephen King fan, especially not just because like you just mentioned how prolific he is, but it seems like his son is going to carry the torch. Uh, at least one of them is. Yeah. And we're all the, the, the better for it. It's really, absolutely. we're really spoiled. And I really, really have to appreciate what we're getting. And his next book, the, the Institute looks like a return to his horror roots. In oh a yeah. Big way. I can't you wait. Know, you know, like I, as soon as I saw that, I thought uh, the shop, this has got to be like the mm -hmm. a descendant of the shop. So I don't know if this is like Firestarter 2 or something, but we'll see. But uh, yeah, it's Teddy Days. And I want to thank you for coming on. And I hope Thanks you enjoyed yourself. Me. Yes. and uh, Absolutely. Internet, uh, Wi-Fi, Skyping problems aside, I'm pretty sure this will turn out to be pretty good. All right. Well, I appreciate you having me on. All right, sir. You take care. And down the road, uh, we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right. Have fun. Go to work. Make big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will do so. Okay. Thanks again, Brian. Take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.